Well, I invite you to please turn in your copy of God's Word to John chapter 4. John chapter 4, as we continue to take a life-changing look at the life of Christ. This morning we find ourselves once again considering the interaction between Jesus and the woman at the well, Jacob's well. Our text for this morning will be verses 28 through 30, and then we're going to jump down to verses 39 through 42. Lord willing, we're going to circle back and hit verses 31 through 38 next Sunday. 31 through 38 are actually a little interlude that John includes about the conversation that Jesus has with his disciples while the Samaritan woman leaves. But in order to keep the flow of the Samaritan woman this morning, we're going to look at 28 through 30 and then 39 through 42. So take a look at God's word, verse 28. I'll read these words for us. So the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of the town and were coming to him. Now jump down to verse 39. And many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them. And he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. Let's pray and ask the Lord's blessing. Father, I would ask that you would help us to see what this woman saw in Jesus, that you would help us to know and feel and be impacted by him in ways like she was. You've included this account, this interaction, these details in your eternal, everlasting word for a reason. And so we turn to them now. And we ask that you would feed our souls with these words. That you would encourage us by them. That you would inspire us to stronger belief in Christ. And lasting change in our lives. We love you, Lord. We ask your blessing upon us. Amen. Amen. For the past three Sundays, we've seen how Jesus chose to masterfully reveal himself and his message to this shunned and shamed Samaritan woman. He's offered her living water that wells up inside of a person into eternal life. He's talked about the burden she carries of having five failed marriages. He's brought up the weight that she's now carrying of living with a man that is not her husband. He's revealed to her that despite her efforts to hide her sin and shame, he still knows all about it. And yet here he is sitting with her at the well, offering her eternal life. He instructs her, the most unlikeliest of pupils, on how to properly worship God. She's concerned about where to worship God. And he tells her it's not about location, it's about worshiping him in spirit and in truth. And he's having this incredible conversation with her despite the cultural pressures not to. She's a woman. She's a Samaritan woman. And as we learned last week, rabbis don't talk to women, especially Samaritan women. But here he is. This remarkable encounter with Jesus, this life-changing, hope-instilling, grace-filled, compassionate, truthful, yet kind encounter with Jesus blossoms into immediate effects on this woman, this Samaritan 
woman. And I want us to consider this morning some of the effects that this encounter had upon her. Church, Jesus changes lives. That's our main point this morning. Jesus changes lives. Knowing Jesus, it transforms us. Learning about Jesus deeply affects us. Trusting Jesus crucifies, kills our old life and causes us to be born again. This is what Paul wrote about. This is his own testimony in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, when he says, I've been crucified. I've been killed with Christ. And it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, in this body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and who gave himself for me. Church, this is the, one of the great impacts of believing in, in trusting in the gospel. Jesus changes us. When you come to know him, when you have a relationship with him, when you embrace the mercy and the grace that he offers to you, then you will not stay the same. He affects us. He changes us. And these verses that we're looking at this morning provide us with a glimpse of how coming to know Jesus changed this woman. So let's look at some of these effects that John records for us. Effect number one, she left her water jar. <laughs> she left her water jar. The beginning of verse 28 says, so the woman left her water jar. And we might read that and think, why is that important? Why does God include that little detail in his word? The woman left her water jar. Why'd she leave it? It may be that she wanted Jesus to have some water as he ate the food that the disciples just brought him. Remember the scene. The disciples had left, got some food in town, and they came back with the groceries, wanting him to eat it. Maybe she just wanted him to have some water with his food. Or it may have been something as simple as she just forgot it. In her excitement, in this incredible conversation that she just had, she may have just left it there in her haste. Or maybe that she's acting on his promise to give her living water, and so she's ditching the water jar in an act of repentance and communicating, Jesus, I trust what you've said. Or maybe it's some other reason that she left the water jar behind. The truth is we don't know because the author doesn't tell us. We're not given the reason. But this we do know for sure. No matter why she left it, she left it. Her interaction with Jesus impacted her and it changed her plans. It changed her course of action. Whether it was something as simple as she forgot it in her excitement, or she left it because she's expecting Jesus to give her living water. The fact remains, Jesus left an immediate impact on this woman's life. That's why John includes this minute detail. Church, every time that you meet with Jesus... There is an opportunity for him to change you, to impact how you're living your life, to change the course of your day, 
your attitude, what you're doing, how you're treating your spouse, how you're treating your kids, how you use your tongue, how you use your eyes, how you use your mouth, how you use your mind. Every time you meet with Jesus, it has the potential to have life-changing effects upon you. Whether you're on your knees praying to him, or you're in your chair reading his word, or you're here at church hearing him proclaimed, or you're listening to a sermon on your phone, meeting with Jesus, and listen, this is not profound, but it is to have a profound impact on our lives. Meeting with Jesus can and ought to change us. There is a sense in which it ought to be very normal for us to meet with Christ through his word and it bring some change within us every single time. But how many times have we heard or seen Christ proclaim and it not make any difference in our lives. Look, we should expect our encounters with Jesus to change us. He's in the business of changing people, and we ought to be looking for that change. When we meet with Christ, listen, we should expect to repent. We should expect to adjust something in our life. We should expect to find courage, power. We should expect a change in our attitude, a forgiveness in our spirit. We should expect to tweak our priorities or how we're going to spend the next moments of our lives. This is why scripture tells us repeatedly to clean out our ears and to open our eyes, to get rid of our hard hearts and to replace them with soft clay. Church, Jesus wants to change you to become more like him. So he or she who has an ear, let them hear. Speaking of this change, and this is an important point, oftentimes these changes are small or subtle, like leaving a water jar behind. But that's not how many of us think. Instead, we're looking for huge sweeping changes to take place at the snap of a finger at the, or at the conclusion of a short prayer. When oftentimes the changes that God seeks to make in our lives are much smaller, much more incremental than that. Baby steps. How do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. How do you become like Christ? One decision, one choice at a time. Do you want to know what transformation looks like in the life of most people? You know, most of us are kind of waiting for this Damascus Road experience like Paul had, right? We're waiting for the light to shine from the heavens and to blind us and to hear the voice of Jesus and all of a sudden transform us like he transformed Paul. Do you know how many Damascus Road experiences there were in Scripture? One. Do you want to know what it looks like? Do you want to know how transformation looks like in most people? It looks like forgetting your water jar because you've been with Jesus. And you go do what he wants you to do. 
It's having patience with your kids after you've spent time with Jesus. It's using your voice to be gracious to people rather than using it to speak judgment or gossip or slander or harsh words because you've been with Jesus. It's experiencing joy deep inside. Why? Because you've been with Jesus. It's being good to people that you pass by on the street or in the grocery store rather than indifferent because you've been with Jesus. Church, spending time with Jesus can bring endless change to our lives every day, multiple times a day. Something as simple as leaving a water jar behind at the well is a tangible sign that God is at work in your life. This woman had only just met Jesus, and he's already making an impact on her life. Don't, don't overcomplicate your transformation. Don't overcomplicate or get bogged down in becoming more like Jesus. Look for the little things that God is doing in your life, the seemingly small ways that he's seeking to change you. It may be that God is using these small changes in your life to make a very big difference as you become a more faithful follower of Jesus. Let me illustrate before we move on. Friend, you are a walking, talking, thinking, learning collection of over 30 trillion cells. But you are not always made up of 30 trillion cells. As a matter of fact, you, like every other human being, started out as one single microscopic cell called a zygote. But when you combine little things like cells with other little things, it can result in amazing things. Christian, the little changes that Christ can make in your life combined with other little changes that he makes in your life can become huge changes. In fact, they can make you like Jesus. So that's the first effect. She left her water jar. Effect number two, she sought out the people in town and gave public testimony. Simple observation. She sought out the people in town and gave public testimony. Verse 28 again says, So the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me all that I ever did. Come, see a man that told me all that I ever did. That last line there, that's a hyperbole. An intentional Exaggeration to emphasize the fact that this stranger named Jesus knew things about her that no human, no stranger should know. This man, as she goes into town, she says, is special. This man is worth seeing. This man is worth stopping doing whatever it is you're doing right now and taking a look at. Come. See a man who told me all that I ever did. Don't lose what's happening here. Don't lose what's taking place. Jesus had such an impact on this woman that she is now seeking out, listen to this, the very people she sought to avoid that morning. The people that looked down their noses at her in shame. The woman she chose not to go to the well with during the cool of the day because of her failures. These 
are the exact same people she seeks out in order to tell them about Jesus. The impact that Jesus was having on her is incredible. Church, Jesus changes people. Despite her past, despite her sin, despite her shame, she cannot help but talk about who she has seen, who she has heard. She left her water jar, she went away into town, and she told the people, come, see a man who told me all I've ever done. Listen, I know it's windy. You guys feel the wind? You guys doing all right? Do you need me to quit? I heard one no. All right, so we'll keep going. Let me tell you something. Ever since we've been working through the book of John, and it talks about how God, the Spirit, is invisible and it's like the wind, I can't help but feel the wind and know that God is here. So as you feel that wind, you be reminded of the presence of God and who it is we sit in front of, who we worship, why we're here. Don't let the wind distract you. Let it point you to him. This woman goes and tells her town, her testimony consists of, come see a man that told me everything I ever did. She goes and what does she share? She shares about the same thing, the very thing that had kept her in hiding. The very thing that had caused her shame, suddenly, it's not causing her shame anymore. Suddenly, she's not hiding anymore. Like Adam and Eve in the garden, the Lord has freed her from her shame, and she's no longer hiding. Her shame is covered. The woman here, as a result of meeting with Jesus, is deeply changed. Dare I say even healed. Most scholars say that Jesus' first healing here in the Gospel of John, it doesn't happen until the next set of verses, and technically that is true. But friends, we have more in our lives that need healing than just our illnesses. This woman's soul, her spirit, her role in society was broken. It was sick. It was infirm. But Jesus brought her healing at this well. Effect number three. Effect number three. Saving faith. Not perfect faith. We see in her saving faith, but not a perfect faith. Verse 29, again, she says, Come, see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? Church, this is a statement that reflects what saving faith in Christ often sounds like early on in a Christian's walk with Christ. Sometimes it's what it sounds like when we face hardship, difficulty, trials, even as an older believer. As a new believer, she finds herself asking, can this be the Christ? As older believers facing difficulties, we can ask, can this be Christ? Oftentimes when we think of having faith in Christ, we think of being steadfast and immovable in our commitment to him. Passages like 1 Corinthians 15, 58 come to mind. Therefore, my beloved, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Hebrews 11, 1. Now faith is is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. And yes, this is the faith, 
the saving faith that we foster and feed and aim for and seek to grow into throughout our lives. But sometimes, this is not what our faith looks like. Especially when we're new to the faith. And sometimes when we're beat down by trial, difficulty. Church, do you remember what John the Baptist asked Jesus even after he had prepared the way for Jesus, baptized Jesus, saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove upon Jesus, and heard the voice of God saying, This is my Son, my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Do you remember the question he asked while he's sitting later in prison, not knowing what's about to take place? We know what takes place. He's beheaded. Do you remember what he asks while he's sitting there in that prison cell? He says, Jesus, are you the Christ? Are you the expected one? Or should we look for someone else? John the Baptist, the greatest prophet according to Jesus up to that point. Doubting whether or not. Jesus was, in fact, the expected one. You can read about his question in Matthew chapter 11 and Luke chapter 7. Christian, can I comfort you with something this morning? Saving faith. Saving faith isn't always void of doubt. Let me say that again. Saving faith isn't always void of doubt. In other words, and I, I need to be careful with this, and we will be careful here. Listen, within the soup, within the pot of saving faith, there is room for doubt to creep in. Notice the doubt coupled with hope in this woman's faith here in John 4. She says, come see a man who told me all that I ever did. You see, nothing's going to take that rock-solid hope and faith of what she had just experienced with Jesus away from her. That was hers. But then notice what she says after this. Can this be the Christ? That is a question with both strands of hope, with room for doubt. Church, even John the Baptist had moments of doubt. He was the greatest Old Testament prophet who ever lived. Christian, I want you to know something this morning. Here's where I'm being careful. We do not ever need to doubt him. But sometimes we do. Child of God, please know that in those moments of doubt... They will not ruin his love for you. It will not cause you to lose your salvation or relationship with him. He promises to never leave us or forsake us. Saving faith isn't always void of doubt. That doesn't mean that we can commit apostasy and walk away from Jesus and never come back and still go to heaven. That's not what I'm saying at all. It means, though, that as you cling to Jesus, if you find yourself doubting or questioning him, or there's splinters of unbelief poking at your faith, it's not the unforgivable sin. I mean, you do realize that the Bible, much of the Bible, is written to help calm our doubts. The entire book of Hebrews is written to people who were doubting. They were doubting whether or not Jesus was in fact the Savior. They were thinking about committing apostasy and walking away from their faith and returning to uh, Judaism. They were doubting Jesus. Church, this is why God has given us his word. This is why he's given us church This is why he's given us the Lord's Supper. This is why he's given us one another. 
so that we can continue to spur one another on and to strengthen our otherwise weak faith. God knows the capacity that we have to doubt him, and that's why he has given us these precious provisions. So I love this honest depiction of the woman's faith here in John 4, 29. She had the beginnings of saving faith, but not perfect faith. And it's so important for us that we have saving faith, and not necessarily a perfect faith. Effect number four. Are you guys still doing okay? Can I do one more? Effect number four, her faith is contagious. Her faith is contagious. Even as imperfect as it is, it's contagious. Verse 29, come see a man that told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of town, and they were coming to him. Now, verse 39, many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. This woman's encounter with Jesus changed her. And her faith, however imperfect it was at the time, it spread through her town. Church, the love and the forgiveness, the reconciliation that Jesus brings our relationship to our relationship with God, the fruit of the Spirit that he gives us, the love, the joy, the peace, the patience, the kindness, the gentleness, the self-control. These are the very things that he fills our hearts with, our souls with, these things that we so desperately long for. He puts those longings in our hearts, and then he fills them. And when he does that, it satisfies a man. It satisfies a woman. It's incredible. So incredible, we can't help but share it with others. This is an illustration that falls incredibly flat, but bear with me. He's like our favorite food. He's like our favorite hobby. He's like our favorite show on TV, except on steroids. We love our foods. We love our hobbies. We love our Netflix series. And so we tell other people about them. We try to convince them that they're going to enjoy them just as much as we do. Church, the same is true of Jesus, except a millionfold. That is what happened to the Samaritan woman. She found the longings, the cravings of her heart that she tried to find in five other marriages and a man that's not her husband. She found in Jesus what she tried to find in solitude and hiding from other people. She found what her heart was craving. And so she went out and she started to proclaim it to the people of her town. She filled her neighbors with a sense of anticipation about Jesus. And then they went out and they experienced him for themselves in verses 40 through 42. Church, to be forthright when it comes to evangelism. You know, I, you don't hear me talk a lot about evangelism in the sense of trying to rally the troops and send you out to evangelize. I don't sit here and call you week after week to go and evangelize. Should you do the work of evangelists? Should you go tell others about Jesus? Absolutely. Instead, I attempt to show you the greatness and the beauty of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because you're not going to be able to shut up about him. Once you catch a glimpse, once you see what she saw, Once you experience what she experienced, 
you will marvel and you will proclaim like she did. Oh, that we would see Jesus like the Samaritan woman. That we would enjoy him. That we would share him. Thursday evening, I treated my family to the delicacies of a fancy restaurant called Dairy Queen. We got ice cream, blizzards. I got a Choco Brownie Extreme with chocolate ice cream. It's so good it should be illegal. On our way back to where we're staying right now, in God's providence, we see Pastor Rick walking down the road with two of his kids. My wife was driving, I say, hey, pull over, there's Pastor Rick. We roll down the window and I show him my Choco Brownie Extreme with chocolate icing blizzard. These things are amazing. My kids and I get very excited about blizzards. The next day I'm with my friends, some friends I was hanging out with and I was telling them about the fact that I got to go and experience a special event, going to Dairy Queen and eating a blizzard. They told me the good news. They told me that if you ask the people that take your order to put extra toppings on, they'll do it free. I rush home. I tell my wife and my kids, kids, you're never going to believe it. We can get extra toppings in our blizzards for free. Yeah, when we get excited about something, we tend to tell others about it. So look to Christ. Behold. Christ, be excited for Christ. Let's pray. Well, Father, we thank you for Jesus. We confess, though, at the same time, we can be fools. We can have plugged ears. We can shut our eyes. We can have hard hearts to Jesus. He can call us to do something simple, like forgive or say hi or love or be nice. And we tell him no. God, don't give up on us. Keep revealing Jesus to us. Soften our hearts. Give us eyes to see, ears to hear. Oh, Father, that we might experience what the Samaritan woman experienced. That we might come to know Jesus, even as she did in this first, even brief encounter. God, work in us, we ask. Amen.